Good morning, church. It's a great privilege uh, being with you today. Uh, it's a great encouragement for me uh, to be able to share with you the Word of God. Um, I had the opportunity in the first lockdown, and now again, I have the opportunity again. And I hope that wherever you are, wherever you're listening to this uh, message, that is of great encouragement to you, that is a great blessing to you, and that you are able to ruminate, uh, just like uh, Nick's message before, uh, to ruminate over the Word and uh, everything that we are going to say today. And I hope that um, it's of a, a great blessing to your life and uh, that God really challenges you and uh, challenges you for the better in His relationship and your relationship uh, with Him. So the word I'm going to talk about today is devotion to God. And that's how we're going to end the final few chapters of Nehemiah. When I first had to choose um, what to talk about today, that word devotion jumped out at me. Straight away, I had a memory of a part of my life when I was younger, of what it meant to be devoted, or I saw devotion in action. And that was when I was five years old, I was hit with a lost bullet when I was younger in Colombia. And uh, thankfully, um, nothing worse happened. As you can see, I'm here and I'm okay. And you can barely see a scar anyway, um, because uh, obviously I was five years old. But I've always told this testimony when I was younger to the, to the to my youth group when I was in my church and I always felt it was like an action-packed testimony and it's great but this time when the word devotion jumped out at me I felt the spirit move me and, and I, I got some memories flooding back um, some fragmented memories of my mother staying overnight in the hospital with me uh, when I was five years old and I and I thought to myself when I look back now as a parent myself I understand perhaps what she was going through at the time. She was devoted to me. And even though I had my brother and my sister and obviously my father, but in that hospital at night time, I remember when it was all quiet and dark and I remember just feeling my mother lying next to me and hugging me and feeling protected. And I feel now, I know now as a father, that at that moment in time in her heart, the only thing that she could think about was my health and my well-being. And that was an example to me of what devotion is. Again, when I was 17 years old, um, I had appendicitis and I was sent home on the Friday by the doctors saying that I actually had food poisoning. Until again, miraculously, as a miracle, uh, someone from church actually came, decided to come and visit me. If it was just food poisoning, he had no reason to come, but he felt compelled to come from church and come and visit me. And when he saw me, he said, you know, you, you seem to have what I had when I was younger and I had my appendix taken out, he said. And as it turns out, he said, you know, I recommend you go back to the hospital because this doesn't seem right. And it was like God was talking through him. And again, went back to the hospital. This time they did, you know, did a more thorough examination and they realized that I had appendicitis. But obviously when they actually operated, it had just burst. But luckily, they managed to take it out in time, and uh, I was very, very lucky. And they actually kept me longer, over than a week in hospital, just to uh, keep a check up on me, because it was actually quite serious when they operated. And again, at the age of 17, my mother, and as you can see, I had an image uh, t taken up there. If you can see a stock image of a, a mother taking care of her child. And this is the memory that I have, obviously uh, not in a room, but in a hospital, of my mother when I was at the age of five and then later at the age of 17 again my mother devoted to me because I was in her heart at the time. That is what I saw in my life as a testimony of what devotion is. So what is devotion? So devotion is in the Oxford translation is a devotion to somebody or something, a great love and care and support for somebody or something. And this is precisely what I remember what devotion is in my life. It was a, a mother devoted to me because she cared for me and she wanted to support me during my difficult times in my life. As a father now and with my wife Sandra, we've gone through similar things, you know, perhaps not the same as I did when I was younger, but definitely leaving many times, a few times when my daughter was sick at three in the morning, when my son's been sick, going to hospital, always at the wrong time, always at the wrong moment, when you're most tired, that's the way life is. But because you are devoted to them, because you love them, you are called to care for them and support them, you do it. But interestingly, going into Nehemiah now and applying this 
beautiful testimony that I have of my mother, I actually learned that devotion itself, the word, the origin, is actually a little bit different. Or perhaps there's a deeper root that is more important than just loving and caring and supporting someone. And actually, the original Latin version of the word devotion actually means dedicated by a vow. It means to sacrifice oneself or to give or to promise solemnly. So, or it can be reduced to short the original ancient Latin to vow. And that gives me a whole new perspective looking at Nehemiah and the final few chapters. And we see this. We see in Nehemiah that they rebuilt the wall in the first chapters of the first six, five chapters. You know, we read obviously that it was built in 52 days, that it was done in great, great time, that they were dedicated, devoted even to rebuilding the wall. But as you can see now, rebuilding the wall was a matter of the heart. God wanted to rebuild not only the outer wall, not only the outside of their lives, but he wanted to rebuild what was inside. He wanted to rebuild the heart. To be truly devoted to something, to really love something, we need to rebuild the walls, rebuild the foundations of our hearts and our relationship to God. And that is what Nehemiah was learning through his life. And that is what Nehemiah and the people of Israel learned exactly at this crucial time for the people of Israel. You see, the self is sitting on the throne, as you can see on the image I put up there. And we're going to see now that the people of Israel, for many years, since they were taken to captivity and back, they had their own selves in the throne of their hearts. Yes, the city was in ruins, and that was a reflection of what was happening in the heart. And God, with his mercy, using the Persian kings, allowed them to rebuild slowly but surely the temple, the slowly but surely the outer wall through Nehemiah. But now came the crucial part, the climax, the decisive part, and it's the same for our lives. God works in many ways through our lives, in through our work, through our children, uh, through our health. Uh, through our education, if you're going through education right now, and we pray and we ask God, rebuild, build my life. Let me build a strong foundation in my life. But now today, to be truly devoted, we need to start rebuilding the walls of our hearts. So the challenge begins. And this first challenge um, of the struggle between the Word of God and our own selves to dominate the thrones of our hearts. We go to chapter uh, 10 in Nehemiah, verse 10, verses 28 to 29. It says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons, and daughters who are able to understand, all of these now join their brothers, their nobles, and bind themselves with a curse, an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord. Remember verse 29, and now join their brothers and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow bound by an oath bound by an oath devotion what oath have you taken in the eyes of God do you remember when you said Lord Jesus I accept you in my heart to be Lord and Savior you were bound by an oath you were set free but you were born again to start a new Christian life and God is calling us to remember the joy of that first oath. And if we forgot the decrees, if we forgot the laws that God has given us, this new covenant that we have the privilege of having through Jesus, that they didn't have in the time of Nehemiah. But even then, God was merciful. God protected them. God provided for them. God used the own Persian Empire to give them the tools and materials to build. A secular people was used 
so that the people of God could actually rebuild their own temple. So I ask you now, that's the first challenge. Where is the oath? Have you kept your side of the promise? Because did you know that if you continue Nehemiah and all the prophets, the more and the more you start hearing about the coming Messiah, the coming Saviour. And when the New Testament begins, the New Covenant, that's when Jesus appears. So Lord, your Lord God, our Lord God, kept his covenant, kept his side of the bargain. Jesus went all the way up to the cross and finally defeated sin and finally defeated death. So God kept his side of the bargain. Now it's our side. And that is what God was working for the people of Israel at this time of Nehemiah. The round two, perhaps the second challenge um, that we need to consider that the people of Israel in Nehemiah were going through as well was the dedication of the womb. First, they had to remember and redo the oath, redo, be devoted anew with God. But secondly, they decided they were encouraged by the Spirit to dedicate the wall. In Nehemiah 12, 27, it says, At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps and lyres. And actually later on, it says the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction and I followed them. So literally what Nehemiah, all these instructions that you see, which it takes pages and, and many of these paragraphs are full of Nehemiah giving instructions about thanksgiving, about dedicating, about worshipping, praising God. And they, what they actually do is they start going round the perimeter of the wall and start praising God. You remember in Jericho, how they used to go round seven times and blow the horn so that they can uh, uh, reduce to rubbles the wall of Jericho. Well, this side is the other way around. Rather than to tumble a wall and reduce a wall to, uh, to rubble, it was actually to dedicate this new wall that was built, a new foundation. What does this remind you of? It reminds me of Jesus when he was given the parable of building in the sand and building in the, in the rock. They built in the sand before those of Jericho. But now here in Nehemiah, God is asking them and he's preparing that message that Jesus later on gave to those who listened. Build the foundation on the rock. Are you building on the rock? Are you dedicating this wall that you just built in your life to God? The round three. And this is in Nehemiah 12.43. And this says, sacrifice and thanksgiving by all. So Nehemiah 12.43 says, And on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. So they've gone through the oath. They've gone through dedicating this new foundation on the rock and praising and worshipping God. And remember, it was the wives, the children, the sons, the daughters. The Bible is very specific sometimes when you notice the difference. Sometimes it says children. Sometimes it says sons. Here is saying wives, sons and daughters. It's very specific. The Bible has inspired these men for a reason. It's telling us that everybody in church is responsible. Everybody from the child to the elders to the adults it doesn't matter your age or where you're from God is asking everybody to rebuild anew the heart and to sacrifice and give thanks given to all and this sacrifice is the final and leads us on to our conclusion today what have you left to sacrifice in your life to be able to dedicate to this world to God and to be able to de dedicate and renew your oath again what is this taking the throne that should belong to God, that should belong to Jesus, that is struggling? Just we see in the picture, we see Jesus is struggling with the self, that fight between the two inside our heart. What sacrifice is God is asking us? What is taking God's place that doesn't allow to Jesus to fully sit on his throne of, his, of our heart? So who is sitting in the throne of your heart? Is it the self? Is it you? Is it all your life? Just like the power of the sower, the forms, you know, everything else is taking 
preference to God? Have we taken priority? Are we in a struggle at the moment? Are we fighting to see who, we, who, who sits in the front of our hearts? Or do we have Jesus reigning in the front of our hearts? So, if you are a person who's listening for the first time, I've got a secret for you. If you've never devoted yourself to God and you never had asked Jesus to sit in the front of your heart, I've got a secret for you. Right now in lockdown here in London, we're not allowed to mix households. We're not allowed to go to different social bubbles. But did you know that Jesus is at the door knocking to come and eat with us and he is not regulated by the government and he is not regulated by the social bubbles because he is omnipresent and omnipotent and almighty and he can go to each individual unique person in this planet on this earth who is willing to open the door and eat with him revelations 3 20 says here i am i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens this door i will come in and eat with him and he with me so remember god is at the door and he's not limited uh, by the social bubble he's not limited by the coronavirus god took to the cross all ailments all sickness all disease in the cross so we can come to him if right now you feel that you are lonely you feel that this is taking too much uh, pressure for you perhaps you are lacking in your life perhaps you are physically ill right now let jesus come into your heart and in him reign and you will see the massive changes and the massive output that he gives to your life Proverbs 23 26 says my son give me your heart and let your eyes keep my ways give him your heart let Jesus come into to your heart and reign perhaps you are struggling right now perhaps you are if you see the image right now you are struggling with the self and Jesus and you 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 actually have both of them on the seat or none of them on the seat of the throne of your heart well Peter 1 8 says though you have not seen him you love him and even though you do not see him now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible joy and glorious joy inexpressible and glorious joy remember the thanksgiving that Nehemiah was teaching his people to do perhaps this is what is lacking and this is what you need so that Jesus can now take a front of your heart church inexpressible and glorious joy if we do have that let's share it with others and if we don't have it let Jesus take control of your life take away the self now and it will reign in your heart and finally if we do have Jesus in our heart already look what it says in tens act in uh, Acts 10 2 and we have an example of the way it should be Cornelius calls for Peter and Cornelius was a perfect example. In chapter 10, verse 2, he says, He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed regularly. So this is the challenge for all of us who perhaps we say with trust, yes, we have Christ in our hearts. But look, Cornelius had God in his heart. And why? Because he was constantly praying to God regularly. He was given to those in need and he was devout and God-fearing. So here's our challenge for us to continue. Remember, guys, remember Isaac Newton, the famous story that how he uh, discovered gravity when the, they say the apple fell on his head, as they say in some places. But if you look at gravity, if you were to toss a ball right now up in the air, the force that you give it perhaps could be very strong. It could go up a few meters, but that ball is going to go down again because it's going to lose. So you have to continually use the strength of your arm to keep the ball up in the air to go against gravity that is a perfect example a simple example of what christian life is we need to continue throwing it up we need to continue praying helping to those in need god fearing worshiping and praising god and you will see that we will continue to have that strength and we will have a strong arm and every time we'll be able to throw it further and further until we have the opportunity to see jesus again Church, I end with this message and the message goes back in full circle, 360 degrees to Nehemiah 10.39. Just as at the beginning, 
in full circle, guys, we will not neglect the house of our God. Church, I encourage you to not neglect the house of the Lord because this is where we're going to spend our life forever to have inexpressible and glorious joy. God bless you, church. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.